So just as government trans or just as social media is allowing members of the public to bring transparency to government by, as was shown, bringing to light activities of the government, organizing people to change the government, governments are also using social media as a way to try to communicate, interact with, and bring services to members of the public. So you have, on one hand, with this, a tool that is transparency from the people, and you have transparency to the people. And so today, I'll be using the example of the US government and their use of social media to talk about how the use of these tools may be leaving out some segments of the population. And the reason for using the US government as an example with this is, is multiple. Uh, first off, since the advent of e-government, our, the US government has been very enthusiastic about adopting new features, new approaches, new tools. Uh, we also have the interesting thing that in the United States for about 45 years, according to the Supreme Court, information access is considered a fundamental part of freedom of expression and thereby information access is actually a constitutionally protected right in the United States. And finally, we have an administration in the presidency currently whose use of social media as a candidate was enormously important in becoming president and influencing not only other subsequent uh, approaches of candidates, but also heavily influencing the approach of the administration in use of social media and the wide embrace of it. So there are a lot of opportunities, obviously, if you are a government for using social media to bring transparency. Um, you know, the, the, the US has a lot of different initiatives from monitoring budget and spending to the data.gov where it's, here, have a bunch of data, see what you can do with it, to the challenge approach of offering, here are problems we have, see what you can do with it as a community. Um, other governments have taken approaches to ways of using social media to limit bribery possibilities and to speed up going through processes of applications or approvals or to monitor how government grant, uh, not grants, but, uh, government dollars are, are given out in, in terms of making sure that an agency is, is giving the lowest bidder a grant. Um, so we see Generally, there are about three buckets you could put these opportunities from a government perspective into. One is democratic participation and engagement. Another is co-production. And the third is crowdsourcing solutions. And I've just given sort of backwards examples of all of these. Uh, so, some ideas cut across these. Uh, there's uh, nearby here, there's the city of Alexandria, um, not the same one as mentioned in the last presentation, Alexandria, Virginia where they have uh, a, a group of, uh, the city government in coordination with a group of nonprofits have created a website to try to, what I would call community source solutions. That is, the, the government, the city government can bring forth problems, the nonprofits can bring forth problems, and then through the website, the nonprofits, the government agencies, the individual volunteers in the community work together to figure out, okay, what are we gonna do to fix this? And they've attacked problems from the a local food pantry really needs baby formula up to much more complicated issues. But all this coolness is, is really only possible as a involving the entire community, the entire country, whatever level you're talking about, if equity of access exists. And so far, Government use of social media, in the United States at least, isn't translating to widespread citizen embrace of government use of social media. From the good folks at Pew Internet, we know that a, a fairly robust seeming, almost a third of, of Internet users are government social media users. But the catch to that is almost everyone who's using government social media was already using traditional government websites. So what that works out to is you're really not bringing new people into the equation in terms of dialoguing, communicating, getting services from the government. And a surprisingly robust number of people um, who are internet users aren't even sure if this is a good idea yet. 
And so lack of usage could come from not only the, I'm not sure this is a good idea, but also real limitations that affect certain communities. Availability and geography is, is one of the problems. Simply living where there is not infrastructure to support being a part of the online world is still quite possible in the United States. There, th this is something that people who are in academia, policy making, technology, seem to overlook quite a lot. But you don't have to drive far from the DC metro area to get to spots where you're pretty much not going to have the infrastructure. Geography plays a big part in that. Um, mountains, for example. Or if your town is a nine hour drive from the next town. Um, I think we call that Wyoming. But there are lots of places where this is you know, surprisingly hard to get access. And it also can come from telecommunications companies not really wanting to put down lines to a particular place because they don't consider it financially viable. Economics is another issue. You have to be able to afford this access somehow. It, whether it's a, a, a computer and a subscription to Fios or whatever you get locally, or it's only a mobile device and a data plan, that still costs money. And we had seen a big jump in people who didn't have access before going straight from not having a computer to having a mobile device and data plan. But as these new pay-as-you-go models start becoming more commonplace with mobile devices, that's going to seriously negatively affect the people who can least afford to pay for data. Language and literacy are, are another issue that comes into play here. Language is, is quite simple. Uh, the discourse, at least using the US government example, in social media from the government is English based. Now, you can come to problems like, we know another Pew study here, 78% uh, of people in the United States who are Latino use the internet if they speak English. However, if you live in the United States, are Latino and do not speak English, 32% use the internet. These are, these are big gaps that come into play if you're delivering inform critical information, critical services, critical communication between the government and the people through social media. Literacy is another big problem. Not just literal can you read, but this kind of, this kind of interaction requires technological literacy, you know, what, what's often called digital literacy. Can you use the technology to get there? Or do you know someone who can help you use it to get there? And also, a much overlooked but really central thing here, government literacy. Do you know what government agencies are? What information they're going to be providing? Can you tell the difference between somebody from a you know, piece of information coming from the NIH versus some Yahoo who has a different theory on how flu spreads? And finally, disability. Um, you know, the, the, the population who least is able to use the internet is persons with disabilities due to the barriers built into the infrastructure of the internet. The, the physical computer or mobile device, the connection, the websites you get to, uh, oftentimes have barriers built into people with disabilities and social media is no exception to that. There are also implementation issues when you're talking about government use of this stuff. Usability is a big problem. Um, I, I don't know, um, perhaps in this audience it's less of, uh, going, don't, going to mean less, but when you have an average user encountering government presences on, on the internets, um, it's often difficult to figure out what to do if you are not of the, you know, having the government literacy. These aren't necessarily intuitively designed, they're often designed based on how agencies want to present themselves or schemes that aren't based around users. Accessibility, this goes back to the disability issue. This is, a, you know, as I just mentioned, a really big thing. It affects both in terms of a usage and an implementation. Findability, this is something from our research that is, is really a big problem with government use of social media, which is just kind of not being noticed. At least, it's, not being, it's being noticed by users, but not others. That is, this stuff isn't in one place. It isn't coordinated in how it looks. It isn't something, if you don't know all of the agencies, you're going to be able to sit down and say, hey, I want to find so-and-so on, 
And what happens is a lot of potential users actually give up quickly because they can't figure out exactly what they're looking for or find it. And consistency plays into this because, you know, this is a broader problem with e-government in the U.S., but you don't have a standard presentation, a look, something that signifies this is part of, this is authoritative. So what we seem to be in the position right now is social media seems to be following the pattern that many technologies do. They benefit the already technologically privileged. However, this pattern doesn't actually have to be the case. And we already have a very strong policy infrastructure that points the way out of this. And this is something, in thinking about this in policy terms, is extraordinarily important, in so much as the internet itself, and then social media in particular, is becoming more and more central to being a citizen, to participating, to being part of a society from a government standpoint, but it's also a broader, so there it's, you're talking civil rights, but it's also a broader human rights issue as more education, employment, socialization, everything moves to being internet reliant and in many cases heavily dependent on social media. Lack of inclusion in any aspect of this, but it's particularly vital in a government sense, cuts people out completely. So as we move forward with this and think about policy, we are really talking about legal issues, but also human rights issues. And so from the policies we have right now, we actually could do a lot more. The first thing is thinking about this really in an access and implementation as being inclusive approach. So instead of agencies adopting technologies, actually evaluating them, figuring out okay, who, who do these miss? Can we work with the company? Or can we use a different alternative? Could we build something and accomplish the same thing? The, this, this notion of inclusive access is buried in all kinds of different laws. Just to use the, ex the disability example, we have Section 508, which the go government is supposed to be holding itself to be using only inclusive technologies. Um, it has more or less successfully ignored this for 13 years, but it's on the books. But there's also, when you're talking about inclusion and disability, the ADA, the IDEA, the other parts of the Rehab Act, the Telecommunications Act, the E-Government Act, all point to the same thing of this should be done inclusively. And that's just an example with one population. So following what's there would greatly increase equity of access. But you can also think about this in terms of promoting awareness and outreach. And this goes to the groups who are being lost in terms of findability, in terms of consistency. Increasing awareness of what government is doing on social media, why it matters, how you can find it, how you can identify it, how you can work with it. Some of the approaches that have been taken thus far on this, on this issue have been, I guess, quixotic at best. Um, there's, there's a wonderful training resource that has been created by the federal government called digitalliteracy.gov. It's a wonderful basic training tool online. And that's the inherent problem. Going to a website that teaches you how to use a mouse presents difficulties for most users who need the website. And so you can, you can it's great if you're in a library, a school, you're with someone who knows how to do this, can sit you down and say, I will take you here and let's learn. But in terms of just throwing things out there like that, it's, the, it's, it's a wonderful notion, but not the right implementation. And so we also need to think about how do we reach people on the technologies they're actually using. This is particularly important with social media and mobile devices, but designing for not just the user to make it usable and accessible and functional and findable and consistent, but also designing for the user and the platform that they're going to be interacting with, with the technology, with the social media on. And finally, this, this, this is the, the biggest idea and the hardest, making sure that your policy objectives harmonize with what you're actually doing. And you know, the, the Section 508 example is a wonderful uh, example of not doing that. 
Section 508 was signed into law in 1998, was supposed to have been implemented in 2001, and by that point, all government online presence was supposed to be accessible to people with disabilities. Since then, every study, I mean, the, the studies that have been really exciting have found into the teens percentage being accessible. The most recent one I read came out a couple months ago, and they had found 7% of government web presence was accessible to people with disabilities. And so you can have policy objectives, but if you're not implementing those objectives, you're not really doing anything productive. And so in this sphere, putting this in the lens of not only are we talking about a legal right to participate, but a constitutional right, a human right, linking up what policy is doing with what, it's, what, what policy expects to be happening with what is actually being done is really vital to make sure that this way of communicating, interacting, providing services is inclusive of all these different populations that are in this country or any city or wherever you're trying to reach. So here's a few things which I'm not sure if this slide would even be readable, but that we've done uh, recently on this issue at the Information Policy and Access Center here. And um, I guess we now move to the questions. <laughs> so my question for y'all would be, what could, from, your, from the perspective of the people who produce content, the backbone of the infrastructure of how this works, what could be provided from a government standpoint to incentivize the creation of things that are more inherently inclusive and helping, say, governments adopt more inclusive technologies? Abdur. <laughs> um. Can't hear you, Adder. <laughs> it it, it seems like there's, it's not a technology problem. There's, there's a larger education problem before you even get to that. And like, the, there's like a common theme for the last two days where people think technology actually is a person, has emotions, has an agenda. It really doesn't, it's, it's just a tool. And right now, if people aren't on the internet or don't have access, technology isn't going to solve that problem. If people don't know how to use a mouse, technology isn't going to solve that problem. We can make it easier, but it doesn't solve the problem. All right? So accessibility, like if people aren't thinking about that when they do anything, it's, technology isn't going to solve that problem. All right? We can build tools to make you know, any website easier for you know, text to speech. We can do all those things already today, it's just that people aren't doing it. And that's education. So I'm gonna throw it back at everyone here. Like, it's just a tool, go use it. Yeah, it's almost like a campaigning issue, you know, to get the word out there. I guess that's a form of education. You know, using any kind of media uh, to distribute information you possibly could, if it's a billboard or whatnot. But it seems like the word needs to get out there. I, I have to agree. Um, I know that's rare, <laughs> but, but, but I think the issue you're, you're getting at is that um, people developing the accessible, the findable, the usable interfaces follow the sort of natural force lines of opportunity. That is, they're going to do it when there's some money behind it, or there's some power behind it, or they're motivated to do it for some reason. People rarely build giant infrastructures like, say, the Taj Mahal for no basic reason. There's got to be some motivator there, right? But I, I, I will agree with your, your premise, which is one of the things is, is just paying attention. And we have to figure out how to teach people more, more broadly. So as an example, I, I was teaching a class. I teach often at classes in, uh, on web search. And I was teaching at Santa Clara, well, an unnamed Silicon Valley uh, library, public library. And we were teaching this class in Chinese, not, not me personally, but one of my, one of my associates. And we discovered, we started teaching the class, we discovered that no computer in that library had a Chinese input method editor, which means you could not do anything in Chinese. And yet, a huge fraction of their population is Chinese. Wait a second, nobody noticed this? And so the librarians were really shocked because none of them were Chinese. And so it was just a simple awareness of accessibility issues. And the next week they had it. Thank you.